Welcome to the Fiscal 2020 Cultural Development Fund Application Seminar. This seminar will review the steps required to complete an eligible application to the Department of Cultural Affairs Cultural Development Fund for fiscal year 2020. Before viewing this presentation, we suggest you download both the instructions and the guidelines documents from our website at nyc.gov slash culture. These documents will be referenced throughout the presentation and go into even more depth. ¿Tiene alguna pregunta en español? Puede pedir asistencia en español llamando al Help Desk al 212-513-9381. This presentation will include a brief overview of CDF program funding and the CDF lifecycle and how this process works. That will be followed by a review of the guidelines, which includes eligibility and qualifications, DCLA policies, the panel process, the funding process, information regarding multi-year support, and the role of elected officials. We will then review the full FY20 CDF application section by section. This presentation is a version of the live seminar that our agency presents throughout the five boroughs. You can pause the video at any time. Closed captioning is available. We highly recommend attending the live seminar, which includes opportunities to ask questions of the program's unit staff. Dates and locations for those seminars, plus a link to RSVP, can be found on the applying tab of our website. If you're not able to attend an in-person seminar, it's strongly suggested that you review this presentation in full. The New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, known to many in our field as simply DCA, will be using its official city agency abbreviation of DCLA to avoid confusion with the Department of Consumer Affairs. You will see that abbreviation throughout this presentation to refer to our agency. First, let's look at an overview of the Cultural Development Fund process and the life cycle of program funding. The Cultural Development Fund supports a broad range of public services provided by New York City's nonprofit arts and cultural organizations, as well as cultural activities of recognized quality accessible to the public. Funded projects can be as different as the organizations providing them, but they will have a common commitment to serving the public and providing that public access to cultural activities. It's your responsibility as the applicant to define public access as it applies to your organization and make that clear throughout your application. You define who your public is and you define how you are giving that public access to your programming. For your organization, that public may be defined broadly, but it may also be more narrowly defined as a targeted audience, such as individual artists or middle school students. Here is some information on the outcomes of Fiscal 2019, our most recent panel process. We saw 1,153 eligible applications submitted last year, including 350 from organizations that had received award recommendations in a prior competitive pool and were able to renew their grants. 798 eligible applications were reviewed by competitive panels, and 69% of those received a recommendation from their peer panel, including 207 organizations that were awarded multi-year grants. With 36% of new applicants receiving a panel recommendation, it is possible for new applicants to be successful in the CDF process. But with more applicants than ever in the pool and no additional baseline money, it has become increasingly competitive. You've seen this date before and you'll see it again. The deadline for the FY20 application is Monday, February 11th, 2019. This deadline is hard and fast for both the online submission and the paper supplemental materials. There are no exceptions to this deadline. Last year, 16 organizations missed the deadline with either the online submission or the supplemental materials. Please note, the deadline for the supplemental materials is a received by deadline. Hard copies of the supplemental materials must be received in our offices no later than February 11, 2019, whether via the postal service, another mail carrier, or hand delivery. 
organizations that failed to meet either the online deadline or received by deadline for supplemental materials will be ineligible for funding in FY20. We'll discuss the methods for delivery a bit more at the end of the seminar. What happens once the CDF applications are submitted? DCLA program staff members review the applications and confirm that each applicant's borough, discipline, and FY17 income are correctly indicated. We will be in touch if we have questions about any of those categories. We will also ensure that all the required supplemental materials have been included. Incomplete submissions will be ineligible for funding. Once applications are reviewed for completeness, the application forms are submitted to panelists for their qualitative review in advance of the panel. Panels are convened and the applications are reviewed beginning in March. Last year, the volume of applications meant that we held 23 panels. When panels conclude, recommendations are submitted to the commissioner for review and approval. Notifications to applicants go out after the recommendations are approved and the city's budget has been adopted. Some further paperwork is required of grant recipients and we ask for that when award notifications are sent. Typically, 80% of an award is paid as an initial payment and 20% upon completion of services, though payment schedules may vary in some instances. Reporting on annual activities is a requirement for all funded organizations every year. Online final reporting forms are available on our website in the spring and are due at the conclusion of services, but no later than August 1st. Applicants that do not comply with the reporting requirements are ineligible for funding for two subsequent years. The guidelines are critical to the application process and are available for download on our website at nyc.gov slash culture. Applicants must be familiar with the guidelines before completing the application. If you've not already reviewed the guidelines, please pause this presentation and download the PDF before continuing with this section. These are the basic requirements for eligibility for CDF funding. An applicant must be a cultural organization located in any of the five boroughs of New York City. The organization must be incorporated as a nonprofit in New York State as of fiscal year 2017 and current with all New York State Charities Bureau filings. You must be in possession of a unique Federal Employee Identification Number, or EIN, and certified tax exempt under IRS Code Section 501c3 while being able to demonstrate at least two years of cultural public service in New York City. If your organization is incorporated as a nonprofit but does not have its own 501c3, you may be eligible to apply, but you must use an approved fiscal sponsor or conduit. Your organization will be required to provide evidence that your agreement with the conduit is current. If you're not sure whether your conduit is eligible, please contact us at our help desk at 212-513-9381. Applicants cannot be individual artists. There are DCLA regrant funds administered by local arts councils on our behalf that are dedicated to individual artists. Cannot be a member of the cultural institutions group or cannot be delinquent in previous recording to DCLA. If your organization's primary mission is other than arts and culture, you must have a long-standing record of cultural programming and demonstrate programs of in-depth artistic quality that are accessible to the public. You must also provide written documentation regarding any annual filing exemptions and submit both your cultural and your organizational budgets. This applies to social or multi-service organizations, religious institutions, or organizations providing general non-arts education, libraries, schools, colleges, and universities. Your application will be reviewed by a panel based on the portion of your FY17 operating income that relates to your cultural activities. As one of these institutions, it is imperative that as you fill out the application, you have separate financial and programmatic information available for the cultural component of your organization for all fiscal years since 2017. 
If you're not sure if your organization has this, please confirm with your bookkeeper that you can provide the required information prior to the deadline. There is more information in the guidelines for these organizations. If you are an organization whose mission is to provide arts education, this does not apply to you. We expect applicants to be fiscally responsible and administratively competent, demonstrated by submission of appropriate financial statements, a realistic proposed budget, and satisfactory reporting, among other things. Your programs should be of recognized quality, exemplified by the submitted materials. Organizations are required to have a track record of two years of service in New York City. This will be established with your fiscal 2017 and 2018 activities, financial documents, and an SMU data arts profile. If your organization incorporated in your FY18 or FY19, look into the DCLA regrant program administered for us by the local arts council in your borough. In the Bronx, the Bronx Council on the Arts, in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Arts Council, in Manhattan, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, which represents the entire borough, in Queens, the Queens Council on the Arts, and on Staten Island, Staten Island Arts. Note that if you are awarded CDF funds in FY20, you'll not be eligible for a DCLA regrant from your local Arts Council in the same fiscal year, though you may be eligible for other grants they administer. Your proposed projects must also meet all of these qualifications. They must be a cultural activity of recognized quality that is accessible to the public with clearly stated measurable goals that are within the organization's capacity. You should show diversity in your funding sources from programs that are within the five boroughs of New York City and take place exclusively within fiscal 2020, which begins on July 1st of 2019 and continues through June 30th of 2020. Your fiscal 2017 operating income is a critical figure in the application process. We use it to determine your panel placement. All organizations are required to provide finalized versions of these documents for the fiscal year that ended in 2017 with your supplemental materials. These may not be your organization's most recent filings, but we must receive the documents relevant to fiscal 2017, including the 990 with an end date in calendar year 2017. Please note that your organization will be ineligible for funding if these documents for FY17 are not finalized and submitted as part of your FY20 application. All organizations are required to submit some version of an IRS 990, our requirements are based on current federal and state requirements. For organizations with FY17 operating income that was less than $50,000, we will accept either a full 990 or the e-postcard plus an SMU Data Arts Annual Report that is signed by your board chair or board treasurer. For organizations with FY17 operating income between $50,000 and $250,000, we require an IRS 990. If your FY17 budgets were between $250,000 and $750,000, we require an IRS 990 and an Independent Accountants Review, or IAR. And for FY17 incomes greater than $750,000, you must submit a 990 and your full audited financial statements. Audit thresholds changed in 2017 per the New York State Nonprofit Revitalization Act. Please submit the same financial statements that you filed with the New York State Charities Bureau for the fiscal year that ended in 2017. Public access during fiscal 2020 is the key component of activities funded by the Cultural Development Fund. The guidelines contain a longer list of examples, but here are a few. We can fund the creation of new work, and or the restoration of existing work for public presentation. We can fund arts education programs in public schools or elsewhere within the five boroughs. We can fund community-based arts activities, services that assist New York City's artists and arts organizations, training programs, and the presentation of works in progress. DCLA can fund any of these activities, but only if the public access falls between July 1st, 2019 and June 30th of 2020 and is within the five boroughs of New York City. 
Remember that you're applying to the Department of Cultural Affairs. The activities for which you are requesting funding should be cultural in nature. We include the humanities and sciences in our definition of culture, but not physical fitness, social services, or general education. Please speak with one of us if you have questions about the eligibility of your project by calling our help desk at 212-513-9381. At the same time, it's helpful to keep in mind what CDF won't fund. Do not ask DCLA to support activities outside of the city's fiscal year or outside of the five boroughs. We expect you to fundraise, but we cannot fund you to do so. Capital projects, including equipment purchases and construction, fall under a different unit at DCLA and should not be included in this application. If you are a library or a degree granting institution or closely affiliated with or housed at one, please call the help desk to inquire about eligibility before applying. DCLA also cannot fund proposals for general operating support or internal capacity building. You must propose projects that provide services to the public. Note, however, that if you are awarded funding, as long as those services are delivered as described, you may use the CDF funds to cover any programmatic costs that are not capital expenditures, fundraising, or government advocacy efforts. Your CDF proposed projects cannot include activities funded by any non-CDF initiatives administered through this agency, including the Disability Forward Fund, the Energy Fund, or the Mayor's Grant for Cultural Impact. Please also exclude proposals for programs for which you anticipate funding through the DCLA administered City Council initiatives, which are currently the Cultural After School Adventures, or CASA, Coalition of Theaters of Color, or CTC, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, Sue CASA, or the Anti-Gun Violence Initiative, Art a Catalyst for Change. Note these specific policies regarding CDF funding. CDF can provide funding for up to five projects. We'll discuss this more in depth when we review the application later in this presentation. Applications are reviewed as a whole. Panelists recommend funding for an entire application and do not select from among the projects presented. Funded organizations are expected to do all the projects proposed at the level at which they are proposed. Remember this as you plan your application and keep in mind that out of all the applicants last year, only about 5% were funded at their full request and nearly half of those requested the minimum amount. To give you some context, in FY19, awards were on average about 10% of organizations' total projected project costs. So while you may request up to 50% of the cost of your project through the CDF, you must be realistic in planning your request. We expect to be one of many partners supporting your organization. Remember, while applicants request funds for unique programs and are evaluated on their public services, funds received from the CDF can be used to cover any operating costs except capital expenditures, government advocacy efforts, or fundraising. And while in-kind support can often be critical to an organization, do not include it in any of the budget figures you provide here. There is a specific section in the application where we ask for details regarding your in-kind support. Let's review the panel process. Each panel is made up of arts representatives from the field, plus a representative from the city council, and for borough-specific panels, a representative from the borough president's office. If you'd like to recommend somebody to serve as a panelist, we will be accepting nominations through our website. We are seeking a diverse slate of panelists that are representative of the cultural field from communities throughout the city of New York, so please visit our website to complete the panelist nomination form. If you are a social or multi-service organization or an educational or religious institution, your application will be placed based on your FY17 cultural budget not your overall organizational budget. We have a two-tiered system for panel review, which is based on your organization's actual FY17 operating income. Groups with budgets of $250,000 or less are evaluated according to the borough in which the proposed activities take place. 
not necessarily where the organization is located. In boroughs where volume demands it, panels are further grouped by the discipline each organization indicates in the application. Smaller organizations' budgets and programs often fluctuate, and we're able to keep in closer contact with these groups through an annual funding process. They are eligible for single-year support. Groups with budgets of more than $250,000 are evaluated by panels that are discipline-specific, and they are eligible for multi-year support. For multi-year support, organizations with FY17 operating incomes greater than $250,000 are eligible. Funding recommendations are for each individual fiscal year of the multi-year period. Multi-year support is contingent on the completion of past reporting requirements, the submission of appropriate renewal forms, and the stability of DCLA and the city's budget. Many of the organizations in this budget category will have last been reviewed by a competitive CDF panel in FY17. Remember, previous funding is no assurance that the organization will be funded again. The panels will review FY20 applications through the highly competitive panel process described in this presentation. A fiscal 2020 award will repeat at the same level in fiscal 2021 and fiscal 2022, assuming the organization remains current with reporting. Continuation of that award amount is dependent on the overall fiscal health of the city and the agency. If funded, your award letter will note the amount for the upcoming fiscal year, not for all three years of the multi-year award. Here are the funding priorities for our panel review. Artistic dialogue, audience development, education, preservation, public access, and services to the field. Each panel will review proposals with DCLA's funding priorities and organizational criteria in mind. Detailed examples relating to each of these funding priorities can be found in the guidelines. Remember that DCLA requires that all CDF funded projects be accessible to the public. The participants or audiences you serve, whether the general public, students, seniors, or arts professionals, or any audience particular to your organization's programs must be able to access your programs within fiscal year 20. These funding priorities are the focus of CDF support. An applicant's proposed services need not meet all of the priorities listed, but the panel will expect projects to align with at least one. Note that these priorities are not themselves in priority order. The panel also reviews each application through these organizational criteria. Organizational responsibility, artistic and organizational excellence, impact, and uniqueness of the service. The panel evaluates an organization's potential to realize its projects according to these criteria, which are detailed in the guidelines. It is impossible for an applicant to demonstrate evidence of these criteria without a high level of detail throughout the proposal. The panel will look to the applicant to demonstrate its ability to meet the criteria listed. A positive funding recommendation hinges on the clarity of each of the proposed projects in your application, the level of detail provided in all descriptions, and your successful delivery of public projects that align with DCLA's funding priorities. Each budget category has a minimum and maximum funding level. Give your request careful thought and ask for what you think is realistic given the size of your project, your organizational budget, and your DCLA funding history. Collectively, your applications serve as an indication to the city of the legitimate need for cultural funding, and we want data that is an accurate reflection of that need. For smaller organizations with budgets of $250,000 and less, Recommendations can range from $5,000 to $50,000. Since the CDF cannot support more than 50% of your total project costs, your combined projects must cost at least $10,000 in this budget category to apply to DCLA for funding. For larger groups whose budgets are greater than $250,000, the minimum recommendation is $15,000, which means your minimum project costs must be at least $30,000. The maximum recommendation in this category is $300,000, though that threshold has only been recommended once in the history of the CDF. 
Last year, there was only one panel recommendation at the maximum level across all 23 panels, and it was in the smaller budget category. These are the increments panelists use to make funding recommendations for organizations with budgets of $250,000 or less. They are printed in the guidelines and range from $5,000 to $50,000. These increments allow more time for concentrated discussion of the projects being considered by that panel, rather than a lengthy discussion of dollars. Panels cannot recommend more money than you've requested and can't fund you for less than the minimum award. In this budget category, if you ask for less than $5,000, the panel will not be able to award you anything. In fiscal 2019, the average recommendation for groups in this budget category was about $8,500. Recommendations are made at these increments for organizations with budgets of more than $250,000. The minimum award here is $15,000 and the maximum award is $300,000 in this category. The average panel recommendation for groups in this budget category last year was about $44,000. Also last year, only 20 of the 193 grantees in this budget category were recommended for awards of $100,000 or more. Again, you must request at least the minimum award of $15,000 in this budget category in order to be funded by the panel. Make sure to pay attention to which budget category your FY17 operating income puts you in, especially if you've applied in previous years and your budget has either grown or contracted. Last year, nine organizations made funding requests below the minimum for their budget categories and were ineligible for funding. Don't make this mistake. If your organization is funded, notification will take place after the grant period has begun. Please plan accordingly, especially for summer and fall projects that take place early in the city's fiscal year. We expect each grantee to move forward with the activities proposed, regardless of the size of the award or the timing of our payments. Funds may not move as swiftly as you or we would like, and we appreciate your understanding. Generally, 80% is paid as an advance as early in the fiscal year as possible, and the remaining 20% can be paid out only upon completion of services and approval of final reports. In some years, there have been budget adjustments mid-year that have increased or decreased awards slightly. Those adjustments are made when we issue final payments. It was our good fortune in FY19 to have additional funds added to the CDF, which were apportioned to all funded organizations based on Create NYC priorities. We do not know if any of these funds will reoccur in FY20. Because these are public funds, performance evaluation of funded projects is a required part of DCLA's oversight. One component of this evaluation is site visits. There are only a handful of us and over a thousand applicants each year. So we are not able to visit every year, but we expect you to put us on your email list and keep us informed of upcoming activities. Funded applicants are expected to have adequate insurance to cover their activities. We expect you to be ADA compliant. And funded organizations must follow DCLA's policy for acknowledging the receipt of these funds by including our logo and appropriate credit language in digital and printed materials. All of these expectations are more thoroughly described in the guidelines, including specific policy information for insurance requirements. The support of the City Council, its Speaker, and its Cultural Affairs Committee is critical to our funding process. They are our partners. Not only that, but they devote considerable funding to culture throughout New York City. Keep your city council members informed of what you're doing by sending them a copy of this application and inviting them to events and programs. And should you wish to seek funding from the council, be sure to complete their application as well as ours. They have a process that is separate from ours for making funding decisions and we want you to know and understand how those processes relate and what is required of each. DCLA administers several different and distinct funds for cultural activities. 
in order to be eligible for any initiative or council support that is administered by our agency, organizations are required to be eligible for and complete an FY20 CDF application. This CDF application is the key to eligibility for any grants this agency administers. Without it, your organization will not be able to receive funds through DCLA in the given fiscal year. This applies to city council funding, DCLA capital funding, and specific agency initiatives under the Create NYC cultural plan. There are capital application deadlines on February 20th and March 26th. You can visit the DCLA website to learn more about the capital request process. If you plan to apply to any city council member or delegation for FY20 funds, you must also complete the council's discretionary application in order for DCLA to administer those funds. Their application is due February 19th and can be found on the city council website. City council support takes two different forms. Each year, individual council members may designate cultural organizations for single year support. This is known as discretionary or member item support and is usually allocated through DCLA's budget when it is for cultural activities. In fiscal 2019, DCLA administered over $5 million in discretionary funds to more than 260 cultural organizations for their CDF activities. These discretionary funds can only support the activities in your CDF grant agreement, so be sure to include those activities in your FY20 CDF application. When you approach your council member for support, you must request funds for the activities that you've already included in this proposal to DCLA. In addition to discretionary support for CDF activities, the Council has created a number of initiatives which provide single-year support for specific purposes. For fiscal 2019, these included CASA, CTC, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, Sue CASA, and the Anti-Gun Violence Initiative, Art a Catalyst for Change. While the Council designs these initiatives and designates who will receive funds under them, our agency administers them. Unlike regular discretionary items, these initiative-funded projects cannot overlap with any CDF-funded activities, so do not include them in your CDF application. Again, in order to be eligible for any council support that is designated through DCLA, whether it is for CDF activities or for one or more of the council initiatives, you are required to complete both the FY20 CDF application and the Council's discretionary application found on the City Council's website. If your organization is designated discretionary or initiative support, you must comply with additional requirements, including a qualifications check by the City Council, clearance by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, and mandatory capacity building training for organizations receiving more than $10,000 from the City. We also expect that your organization will be compliant with city and state lobbying laws. You can visit the City Council website to identify the council member for your district. Be in touch with the member in your district or the districts where you provide services to learn more about the City Council's process and any other requirements they may have. Detailed CDF application instructions are available for download from our website at nyc.gov slash culture under the Applying tab. If you haven't already, please pause this presentation and download the PDF before continuing with this section. We're going to show you screenshots from the online application and walk through each of the 11 sections. You can complete the application out of order, which is how we're going to go through it in this presentation. We do this so that we can talk first about the elements of the proposal that will be the focus of the panel's review, and then we'll move on to the other parts of the application. You may want to complete the application in a similar order. The application is essentially the same as in prior years. Character limits for each response remain the same as in FY19. At each step along the way, we will tell you which section we're at in the instructions, which you can download from the Applying tab on our website. You can take notes directly on the related pages, but don't just follow along in this presentation, 
Make sure everyone involved in completing the application keeps the instructions on hand. You can use the instructions to confirm that each person understands the specific response required for each field. You'll reach the application through the DCLA website at nyc.gov slash culture. From our homepage, click Cultural Funding in the header menu, then Grants for Organizations in the subheader, and finally Applying on the left-hand sidebar. From that Applying tab is where you can download PDF copies of the guidelines, instructions, application checklist, and a blank application, as well as required templates and a resource page for topics on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You will launch the application from this page. Note that the online application has been optimized for Internet Explorer or Safari. We strongly recommend using Internet Explorer or Safari when you fill out this application and may not be able to provide technical support for other browsers. You'll see this launch page for your cultural affairs account. New applicants must register their email addresses and organizations. Detailed registration information can be found in the Registration Help Guide, which you can download from the Registration section on the About CDF tab on our website. This is the home page for your organization. The first step for every registered applicant is to review the information in your organization's account profile for accuracy and completeness. It's critical for all organizations to keep their account profile and registration information current at all times. The agency will use this profile throughout the year to contact your organization. This is how you will receive notification of the application outcome, as well as critical information about other funding opportunities and other information that we share with the field. From the home page, you can view your organization's recent online CDF applications and reports. Click the blue Start Application button to begin a new application for fiscal year 2020. If you applied or renewed last year, you may want to review your previous submission as a helpful starting point. Remember to take into account any feedback you received from DCLA previously as you prepare this year's application. Once you've started to work on your 2020 application, you can return to this page to open the draft and continue working. We're now on page six of the instructions. As I noted, we're not going to go in order, but we'll mention the corresponding instructions pages as we move around, and you can also see where we are in the application by looking at the highlighted title in the sidebar. Next, we'll guide you through the organization profile section under organization information. There's one thing you need to do on this page before you can do anything else. You must begin by entering your organization's FY17 operating income. This is the figure that we will use to place your organization in the appropriate panel. The figures entered should match information from your FY17 IRS 990 and should not include in-kind support or capital income. If you're a social or multi-service, religious or educational institution, provide only the FY17 cultural income. In this case, it will not match your organization's 990 filing. Remember to save your work often as you go. The system logs you out after 20 minutes if you've not saved a page or navigated to a different section of the form. This page will pre-populate with information from your most recent online application. Be sure to check all pre-populated information throughout the application carefully. It is pre-populated for your convenience, but you should never assume it is still correct or complete for this year's submission. We ask here for information about your executive director or CEO and your organization's address. The organization address refers to your primary administrative address. This is where your office is located. It may be your home or just one address of multiple locations. Select from the drop-down menu the council district, community board, and neighborhood that correspond to that address. You'll notice circled question marks throughout the application. These contain help text. Click on any of these question marks to open help text specific to the question. If your mailing address is different from your organization address, complete the mailing address section. 
You'll enter text in these fields only if you identify that your mailing address is not the same as your organizational address. Next, provide the organization contact information requested. You must include an alternate non-office phone number, either your cell or home phone, where DCLA may reach you in case of an emergency. Under General Information, enter the organizational code, which identifies your organization by type. Definitions for this can be found in the instructions. FY17 organization income is only for organizations with primary missions outside of culture. They should enter their total budget for the organization here. This will be inclusive of the cultural budget that was required in the FY17 operating income field at the start of this application. If you're using a fiscal sponsor or conduit, enter information about that organization here. Check with DCLA if you're not sure if your fiscal sponsor is eligible. Your fiscal sponsor must be aware that you're applying under their sponsorship. Please identify and be in touch with them immediately as they may have additional requirements before you submit. We are now on page 8 of the instructions, the mission and engagement section. This section is where you will share the mission, history, and principal activities of your organization and then describe your engagement with the public. This section will be the panel's introduction to your organization. The mission, history, and principal activities will be pre-populated if you submitted an application or renewal recently, but review it carefully. You may want to revise and update this information. The space allows for considerable detail, so use it well. Be sure to start with your actual mission statement. The mission statement will serve as a barometer in the panel's analysis of your projects. Your mission statement should focus on your organization's objectives, so make sure that in addition to saying what your organization does, you say why you do it. Then go on to provide detailed information on your organizational history and principal activities, including activities for which you are applying to DCLA for support. The mission field is also where you can include contextual information about organizational programs for which you are not requesting CDF support, such as tours and educational programs outside of NYC, which are ineligible for DCLA funding. If you have a regular venue for your programs, describe that in this mission section. Not all panelists may be familiar with your venue. In the engagement and marketing statement, clearly describe specific engagement and marketing efforts as they relate to the proposed projects. Describe the demographic of your target audience and or your participants, and the media or outlets you plan to use to connect with them. Include any specific details about your work to make your programming accessible and inclusive for a variety of audiences. For example, efforts you are making to reduce economic, social, communication, and physical barriers to participation. This question also asks you to provide information regarding your organization's current and upcoming efforts to assure that our common goals of equity, access, and inclusion lead to representative programming throughout the city. We've posted resources and definitions for diversity, equity, and inclusion topics on the Applying tab of our website, which we hope you will utilize as part of your ongoing and evolving work around these issues. Next, we'll review the staff information section, which provides a profile of your staff and board. Details can be found on page 12 of the instructions. Include all full and part-time employees, paid or unpaid, in the total number of staff, but don't include volunteers or consultants. Think of the people that are on your phone tree or have an organizational email. Tell us how many are paid and how many are full-time. Employees are considered full-time if they are permanent staff working 35 hours a week or more, whether they're paid or not. You can consult your SMU Data Arts profiles for help with answering these questions. The Staff, Leadership, and Stewardship section replaced the Volunteer Program section from past versions of the online application. Describe the efforts your organization is making to reflect diverse representation in your organization's staff, executive leadership, and board. Please address the values of equity, access, and inclusion as they apply to your organization's workforce, 
as well as your organization's investment in the development of voices currently underrepresented in the broader cultural workforce. Don't just reference a standard EEO statement here. This text field has an 800 character limit. We acknowledge that answering such a multifaceted question within the confines of the 800 character limit may be challenging, but do your best to provide a detailed and concise response. Character limits throughout the application will be shared with panelists. After reviewing the FY19 answers to this question from organizations throughout the field, we've come up with some suggestions for how best to address it. Include as many of these as is feasible for your organization and the character limit. Be specific and intentional. Don't just include equal employment opportunity language. Clarify how your particular organization is making an effort to contribute to a more representative cultural field at large. Include statistics. Contextualize your organization's workforce demographics. Show financial access. Identify how your organization is addressing financial boundaries to participation, such as paying a living wage to artists or eliminating unpaid internships. Describe decision makers. Focus on your executive staff and board members, not just lower level staff or interns. Identify goals. Address where you have found weaknesses or blind spots in your organization and what steps you are taking to address them. The staff list accepts up to 10 people. Include your principal, administrative, and artistic staff. These are the people who run your organization and its programs. Be sure to include the executive director, artistic director, and any heads of departments or other principal employees, even if they're already included on your account profile. Salary codes can be found in the instructions. We're now moving to the board information section, which tells us about your governing board. You can find details on page 13 of the instructions. We ask whether your board has an active committee structure, meaning there are subcommittees, such as a committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or a finance committee that meet independent of the full board meetings. Indicate the percentage of your operating budget that comes directly from the board. Note the amount each board member is expected to give or get for the organization on an annual basis. If there is no minimum, enter zero. If the expected level of give-get varies by board member, provide an average. You can enter up to six board members. If your board is larger than that, enter six board officers and key committee heads. For non-officers, you can enter the phrase board member for the board member's title. And regardless of board size, you'll also need to submit a full board list on DCLA's template with your supplemental materials. This template can be found under the Applying tab of the Programs page on the DCLA website, which you will download and print for us. Now we're going to go to the most critical part of this proposal, your organization's proposed services. Please follow along on page 22 of the instructions. The Projects section on the sidebar under Proposed Services is the heart of your application. This is where you'll tell the panel what you are planning to do in FY20 and how you're planning to do it. The panel will spend the bulk of its time discussing what you put in these sections. The narrative portion of this section is the next thing they will see after they read your mission and engagement sections. In the proposed services section, you'll find the project summary page, which lists all the projects for which you are requesting support and it's where you can add a new project or edit a project you've already added. If you choose to apply for multiple projects, the project summary page is also where you'll prioritize those projects once you've entered them. Note that the panel will read your projects in your given priority order. You can apply for a maximum of five projects. If you choose to apply for more than one project, be sure that each project includes the same level of detail as all the others. To begin a new project proposal, click the New Project button. Farther down on the summary page is where your project costs and request amounts are displayed. Note that you cannot enter numbers here. These fields calculate automatically from your entries in each of the project budgets that we'll talk about in a moment. Check these fields closely after you've finished entering your projects. They need to make sense within the context of the project, the organization's budget, and in relation to the guidelines. 
And remember that while you cannot request more than 50% of the total project costs, you must request at least the minimum award for your budget category. The discipline and borough sections of the project summary page are for your entire application. Select one discipline and one borough based on what best describes your application as a whole. This will determine which panel reviews your application. If you provide services in multiple locations, pick the borough that best conveys the primary location of your activities. If your project spans different disciplines, pick the one that your organization specializes in, or pick one of the multidisciplinary sections. For example, a dance company that has an area where it displays visual art, but is primarily a dance organization, should be evaluated with other dance applicants, not as a visual arts organization or a multidisciplinary group. Depending on the volume of applications, some disciplines are grouped together for panel review. When you click the New Project button on the Project Summary page, you are brought to the three substantive parts of the Proposed Services section. The first is an overview section for you to provide general information and a synopsis of this particular project. The second is a details section for the narrative and other specific information about the program. And the third is a budget section for financial information about this project. You'll first be directed to the overview page. The first thing you'll do is title your project. Be concise. Examples of a project title might be main stage series or in school residency. After you title the project, you can save it and it will show up in your project summary list. Project cost and request amount, again, will automatically populate based on the total of all of the expenses that you will enter in the project budget page. The fields cannot be edited from the project overview page directly here. You can adjust these figures in the project budget page itself. The next three responses, the discipline, the borough, and the council district are specific to this particular project. Be sure to select only the boroughs and council districts where the services in that project take place. The synopsis should be a brief summary that includes quantifiable project details, such as the type and number of events, prices, dates, and venues where possible. Be concise here, but don't provide a list. This is intended to be a narrative section. We recommend that you complete this section after you've written your project description, since this is a synopsis of that information. Make sure that all of the information contained in your synopsis is also found in your project description. The synopsis will be the panel's introduction to your program. It's the first thing they will read about your project and it will also be included in your grant agreement if funded. The proposed services beyond FY20 section will appear only if your organization is in the over $250,000 budget category and therefore being considered for a multi-year award. This is the only place that you will describe anticipated activities in fiscal 21 and fiscal 22. If the FY20 project will continue beyond the fiscal year here, explain any changes and enter NA for the next question. If the project will end in FY20, enter NA for the first question and answer the second. An example of a continuing project would be an education program started five years ago that you intend to continue. An example of a non-repeating project might be a 10th anniversary concert in FY20, which will not recur in the future years, in which case you should provide information on a project that you might propose for FY21 and FY22. After you've completed the project overview, you'll move forward to the project details. The instructions are very specific about how to complete the project narrative, so be sure to refer to them for guidance when completing it. Let's talk first about defining and organizing your projects. A project has a distinct intent and objectives and is a distinct program that may also have a distinct audience. For example, a main stage series that includes different productions happening over the course of a season would be one project. A separate project might be a series of lecture demonstrations in schools based on the specific plays being performed. You should consider grouping activities that share similar goals, content, or audiences as a single project. You must make a case for your program in the ways that we're about to discuss, not just provide a list of events. 
Remember, the focus of CDF support is services to the public. We look to the applicant to define its public and describe the access that it provides. It's up to you to clearly define the public that you are serving. DCLA funds projects of both breadth and depth, those that reach a broad range of people, as well as those that provide a depth of service for a small number of people. Your public could be anything from five participants in a series of workshops to 5,000 people at an outdoor concert. If you're projecting to serve more people this year than you have historically, you need to share your plans for increasing your audience or service recipients. A strong project narrative contains all of the relevant details. This is a 3,500 character narrative section with room to fully describe your project. You want to use this space to write a lively, compelling narrative that's going to make the case for support of your projects to the panel. Be as specific as possible. Answer the questions who, what, when, where, why, how, how many, and how often. Use every opportunity to include specific details such as partner names, artist names, actual locations or school partners, number of performances or sessions, and other information that will help the panel understand the scale of your program. Your highly detailed narrative should address how the public will be served by the project and how the project has public access, how the project connects with your mission, what the objectives are and how you will determine success, and the curatorial process, including how artistic decisions are made, such as who to exhibit or what play to do, and who makes those decisions. If you plan to apply for more than one project, make sure to include as much detail in your subsequent project narratives as you do in your first. The panel will expect the same high level of detail for each of your proposed services. Remember that the panel makes its funding decisions based on the application as a whole. The panel may not select particular projects for funding, and they can see if you've copied language from one project to another. Detail about an ancillary program can be as important as the detail about your core program. For example, if you describe an exhibition in great detail, but tack on a sentence at the end that says that we will also have pro public events, such as lectures and tours, the panel is going to want to know how many tours and lectures, when they will take place, who will be served, and who will lead those programs. So make sure not to omit those details. You may reference your background materials in your narrative, but please note that those background materials do not substitute for content in the project description narrative. All key elements of your project for which you are requesting support should be included here. Now, what if you don't know all of the details yet? We understand that some specifics might not be confirmed when the application is submitted. When this is the case, be sure to include as much detail as you can about how you will go about making the decisions that will make the project a reality, including when key decisions will be made and by whom. Review your text carefully to see where you can share specific information with the panel. They will be reviewing your proposals with the charge to invest city funds, taxpayer dollars, in the strongest services to New York City. In order to feel confident in that investment, they need to know the names and credentials of individuals involved, the specific content of programs, the duration and frequency of events, and the specific locations where the program will take place. Again, if you aren't yet sure, provide details about how and when the decisions will be made. Even if a panelist is not familiar with a specific individual or location, the inclusion of these specific details will give them confidence in your plans for the upcoming grant cycle. This paragraph includes information about upcoming programs. However, the language lacks specifics, such as the number of seminars, who will conduct them, and when they will take place. In contrast, this paragraph includes many more critical details, the number of seminars proposed, details about the direct recipients and expectations for the upcoming grant period, the staff names and reference to bios in the supplemental materials, as well as information about confirmed venues and those under consideration. 
These kinds of details will help the panel to evaluate the content and quality of your programs and assess how they meet the stated criteria for funding. We know that the number of characters is limited here, but we also know that it is possible for organizations to present comprehensive proposals with all the details included. We have seen it and we know it can be done. Just as you know from your own public materials, presentation is important. Be sure that your text is presentable. Use proper spacing and carriage returns, which only count as a single character, and note the constraints of the online form. Some formatting tools, such as bold, italics, and underline, are unavailable. If you copy and paste, the text may not appear as you entered it in a word processing program. One long paragraph or text with many abbreviations will be difficult for the panel to review. Use the yellow print preview button found at the bottom of the project summary page to preview what the text will look like to the panel and edit it accordingly. Do not embed links in your narrative. The panel is instructed not to investigate outside links while reviewing your application. Here on the screen are two identical texts. The one on the left includes paragraph breaks and information is highlighted by the judicious use of capital letters. On the right is a dense paragraph peppered with ampersands and abbreviations, but containing exactly the same information. The one on the left allows the reader to find key information on the page. The other makes it far too difficult to do that, and panelists tell us it is annoying to read. Start and end dates. Enter the first and last dates of your project here. You can note additional key dates in the project description. If you don't yet know specific start or end dates, you should enter the first and last day of the month in which you expect the project to take place. The number of direct recipients refers to the individuals who are the focus of your service. For example, if you have a training program for 15 actors with a culminating performance attended by 400 projected people, the direct recipients are the 15 actors, and you can mention the 400 audience members in your project description, but do not include them in the number of direct recipients. If your program is a publication or takes place online, your number served should realistically reflect individual readers or users in New York City and in FY20 only. We do not ask you to break out the number of indirect service recipients here, but make sure to include information about them in your narrative. Specific audience is a multi-select list where you'll identify your target population, the recipients of the services you're providing. Select as many as are appropriate, but use general if there is not a targeted audience. Tell us whether or not you will charge for this service. Free services are great, but by no means required. Many of the projects we fund have a fee to attend or participate. If you do charge for the service, describe the pricing structure and who pays. This could be a ticket buyer for a concert or a school for a residency. Be specific here and quantify those costs by providing a dollar amount or a range. If you have a discount program, please provide who gets the discounts and if there is a scale of discounts that you use. Indicate if and how artists are compensated or if artists pay to participate. Turning to page 26 of the instructions, the education program section refers specifically to projects serving children in grades pre-K through 12. This section does not apply to adult education programs. If the program serves children in grades pre-K through 12, select from the drop-down menu which category of education program best fits this particular project. The instructions include definitions for each of these categories. Describe the evaluation practices of the program and how and with whom you collaborate on the project. Now we'll turn to the project budget. Each project requires a budget that is specific to the project. You can find details on page 27 of the instructions. The fields on this page should only reflect what you anticipate spending and receiving for this project. You'll see the same fields in the organizational budget as well. Be sure to enter the project budget based on the grant period, which is New York City's fiscal year, beginning July 1st of 2019 and ending June 30th of 2020. 
Your operating budget, which we'll address later in the seminar, should be entered according to your fiscal year, which may not align with ours. Please note the help text button next to each field on this page. The instructions also have detailed definitions for each corresponding field in this section. You must have an entry for every field. Enter a zero if you don't have income or expenses in that budget category. You'll begin by entering income and unearned or non-government income. Moving down the line items on the project budget, you'll come to unearned government income, which is where you will enter your FY20 CDF request for each individual project. If you're applying for multiple projects, your request for each project will be added together to represent your total request to DCLA for FY20. When you enter your request in the DCLA project request, think strategically about what you realistically expect from DCLA given all the sources of income for this project. As noted, the Cultural Development Fund cannot fund more than 50% of a project's cost and rarely approaches that level of support. The average award was 10% of total project costs in FY19. This figure is an average across a wide range of requests under 50%, and your request may be less than that. Enter the request amount in DCLA project request, and it will automatically be added to the total request amount on the project summary page. Make sure to include any non-initiative council discretionary funds that you expect to receive for these projects in the DCLA project request field. DCLA Other refers to City Council initiative funds, which we discussed earlier in this presentation. Remember, the projects in your CDF application cannot overlap with activities funded by these specific initiatives. So the DCLA Other line in your project budget is pre-populated to be zero for all applicants. Of course, if you have received initiative designations in the past or you're projecting them for FY20, that funding should be included in your actual and anticipated operating budgets, but should not be included in your project budgets. Neither DCLA capital funding nor any other capital funding should be included here or anywhere else in this application. The anticipated funding field on this page is funding specific to this project. You must indicate with an asterisk funds that are actually committed or received for this project. You want the panel to know what support, if any, is already in place. At the bottom of the project budget, you'll enter information about this project's expenses. Personnel is separated into administrative, artistic, and technical. There are definitions for what this includes in the help text and in the instructions. Make sure to include in the figures here only personnel who are paid as employees and for whom you make withholding deductions on a W-2. Figures should be gross salaries, including fringe benefits for these personnel. Anyone to whom you issue a 1099 should be included in the outside professional services field. From this page, you can return to the project summary page using the yellow button on the bottom right corner where the totals are automatically calculated. We advise that you review the project summary again before submitting to make sure that your total project cost and total request amount are what you want them to be. Remember that your project requests must add up to at least the minimum award in your budget category in order for your application to be considered for funding. Each year, several applicants request $0 and cannot be funded. Be sure that you complete this section accurately. Also on the project summary page, check the status of each project to make sure it is labeled complete. If not, some component is missing and you'll need to go back and check for missing data. If you make adjustments on the project budgets, please make sure that you're making corresponding adjustments to the operating budget for the upcoming fiscal year and if necessary, to the budget notes as well. We just covered preparing budgets for each of your projects. Next, we'll review how to present your organization's operating budget, which is a critical element of your organization's proposal. One of the ways your organization will demonstrate fiscal responsibility is through your operating budget. You can follow on page 14 of the instructions. You will enter your operating budgets for the previous year, the current year, and the projected year. 
FY18, FY19, and FY20. The current year figures should include your complete annual budget, not a year-to-date budget. This will include some projected information. Remember, fields for the previous year and the current year will be pre-populated if you submitted an application or renewal recently. You must update all of these fields, especially since in nearly all cases, these figures were projected when submitted last year. Operating budget figures are for your organization's fiscal year. The fiscal years should match those on your 990 and your financial statements, and they may differ from the grant period. You'll be able to see project and operating budgets together on the budget overview page, which you can access by clicking the yellow button in the top right corner on the operating budget page, or in the final review and submit page. We'll discuss the budget overview page further in a few minutes. As you are compiling and entering your figures, refer to the instructions for specific definitions of each budget field. You can also consult the help text. Numbers that vary by more than 20% between consecutive fiscal years, as well as entries in the categories labeled Other, must be further explained in the budget notes, which we'll look at shortly. Remember to save often, especially when working on the budget part of the application form. As we mentioned earlier, the system logs you out after 20 minutes if you don't save. You'll start by entering your organization's earned income and unearned non-government income. Throughout, the budget subtotals and totals will calculate automatically. As you make your way to the unearned government income section, the DCLA program services line should include both CDF and any member item funds for CDF activities that you have either received in previous years or expect to receive through DCLA in FY20. As we noted in the project budget section, DCLA Other is for non-CDF funding administered by this agency. So here is where you will include council initiative funds in your operating budget. Your capital income and expenses are entirely separate, so do not include any DCLA capital funding in this budget. The personnel categories are the same here as they are in the project budget. Staff salaries should continue to include fringe and benefits, and independent contractors for whom you don't deduct withholdings should be included in the outside professional services field. The yellow budget overview button on the operating budget page brings you here. This is the budget overview page. It will display your three-year operating budget, each unique project budget, and your total project budget figures together. You cannot enter information here because it will populate based on the budget figures you entered in the form. This is a tool we provide so that you can review all the budget information in one place. This is how the panel will see your budget, and you want to make sure the logic between the line items is clear. The panel will spend significant time discussing your budget figures and the accompanying notes, so make sure that there are no errors. All expenses for your project need to be accounted for in your organizational budget. If there are discrepancies due to variation between your fiscal year and ours, make sure to explain that in the budget notes. It's essential to be thorough when completing your budget notes. The panel will look to these notes to provide essential context for your operating budgets. Very rarely should a budget notes field have NA as a response. These notes are applicable to most organizations. Don't miss the opportunity to tell the financial story of your organization. In addition to the instructions, have a copy of the operating budget from either the print preview or budget overview page at hand when filling out this section. For the financial year variation question, identify all budget lines that vary by more than 20% between consecutive fiscal years and explain each of those variations here. The other sources of income and expenses section requires detail for entries in the FY20 budget lines noted. Explain what the budget numbers represent in each of the fields listed here. For example, if you intend to provide training to your teaching artists in FY20, you might include an entry like, Outside Professional Services represents $5,000 in unconscious bias training. The surplus deficit question asks you to explain how you are addressing any surplus or deficit that occurs in any of the three years you've entered on the operating budget pages. 
enter the value of all in-kind support received or anticipated in the current fiscal year, that's FY19, and specify the sources of that support in the field below. This section helps the panel understand how you provide services at a level not equivalent to your income figures. Include just major goods and services or donated items, including donations from materials for the arts, and an actual or estimated value associated with each major donation. Please be realistic in the value you assign to in-kind salaries and contributions. Remember, this is the only place in the application where you reflect in-kind support. It won't be included in your budget figures. In the further explanation field, provide details about anything in your budget that you think might stand out but was not addressed elsewhere. Points here may include explanations of significant budget growth or decline, or project and organizational budgets that, when compared, need to be explained. For example, when your fiscal year differs from the city's, you may need to explain why some aspects of your organization budget do not correlate directly to the project budget. This is additional space that allows you to explain your organization's unique financial circumstances, and we highly recommend that you take advantage of it. In the budget information section, we ask about major budget increases and decreases. This is a dynamic field that will only appear for organizations with FY17 budgets over $250,000. The information provided looks forward to the two subsequent fiscal years that would be covered by a multi-year grant. Special funds are accounts in the form of endowments, cash reserves, and other investment vehicles. Not every organization has these. You can enter information about up to four special funds. If you have more than four, please provide the additional information at the bottom of the funding plan spreadsheet that will be submitted with your supplemental materials. Next, we'll be looking at previous activities. These activities should relate directly to your proposed services for FY20. The panel will look at these activities as an indicator of capacity, your past service to the public, your numbers served, and venues that you have worked in previously. Make sure then that your project narrative addresses any plans for project growth or reasons for contraction. The panel may compare your previous activities and constituents served to what you have proposed for FY20. Enter activities here that actually took place in the 18 month period prior to your application. It'll be between July 1st of 2017 and February 11th, 2019. The activity description allows 250 characters, so provide information beyond just the name of the project. Group like with like to maximize the number of previous activities you can include. Three main stage productions should be one activity, not three. You may enter up to eight activities, and you can set the priority of each to arrange them in your preferred order. Moving up the sidebar, we'll look next at attendance and education. Details can be found on page 10 of the instructions. In this section, provide attendance figures for your completed fiscal 2018. This is attendance for activities within New York City only, not an international tour or your education program in Yonkers. Just as with attendance figures, we're looking for the number of unique New York City participants in your web-based programs. Use a tool like Google Analytics to estimate the population served within the city. Web-based programming is for interactive web programming and services, such as an integrated artist registry or an online video gallery, not for number of visits to your home page or reservations accepted online. Try not to double count individuals. For example, students that participate in your education program might also attend a public performance. Don't count them twice, only count them in the education section. Include all cultural activities that you're providing in New York City, not just those for which you are applying. The ethnicity section below is optional. It's helpful for tracking aggregate information across the city and responses here will not be reviewed by the panel. For arts organizations, ADA compliance often takes the form of access issues. Briefly describe here how you make your work accessible and inclusive to those with disabilities. If you provide any educational programming to children in grades pre-K through 12,
complete the education program section even if you're not applying to CDF for those programs. Indicate here what percentage of the cost of providing educational services came from each of the listed sources in FY18. The percentages must total 100%. Next, we'll review the facilities and venues section. Most of the facilities and venues section is not distributed to panelists, so make sure that any information about the venues for your organization or your programming is included in the project description itself. In the first question, hours open to the public, if you don't have a facility or it isn't open to the public, you can enter NA. The questions immediately following this depend on your answer to primary physical facility. For example, if you indicated that you own your facility, you'll then be asked questions about when you purchased it or if it's a shared space. Next, you'll indicate what percent of your organization's annual budget is spent on space. For social and multi-service, religious and educational institutions whose primary mission is not cultural, indicate here just the percentage of the annual total operating budget spent on cultural space only. Primary locations can include multiple venues. For example, office space as well as theaters or schools you work in that are separate from your primary physical plant. Be sure to include the capacity of each space and list those spaces in priority order. We also ask about upcoming relocations, changes in your venue, or capital projects. It's important for the city to track space needs and trends in the cultural community. Now please turn to page 29 of the instructions. We're getting to the final steps of the online form. On this page, for supplemental materials, you will need to verify your organization's tax-exempt status and let us know about your organization's insurance policies. We'll review what materials in addition to the online form are required for your application to be considered complete. Supplemental materials are hard copy submissions separate from the online form. They supplement the information provided in the application form itself. These informational materials have the same due date as the online form, February 11th, but begin to collect and prepare them as soon as you can. A complete list of required supplemental materials can be found at the bottom of this page, in the application checklist, and in the instructions. We will use your financial documents to establish New York City residency for your organization. If any of these documents have addresses outside of the five boroughs, please call our help desk to determine eligibility in advance of the application. If you hand deliver your supplemental materials, DCLA will provide you with a hard copy receipt. Please hold on to that receipt as well as a copy of your submitted materials until you have received confirmation that your application is complete. In an effort to make the process for delivering supplemental materials more equitable and accessible, please note some changes to DCLA's procedures from past years. As always, applicants are strongly urged to submit supplemental materials in advance of the deadline, either via hand delivery or by mail. Hand-delivered materials should be brought to the Department of Cultural Affairs offices at 31 Chambers Street during weekday business hours between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. prior to the deadline. Please be directed to room 201 on the second floor. If you choose to mail your materials, please take into account that they must be received in our offices by February 11th. Last year, we received over 800 competitive CDF proposals, many of which were submitted on the day of the deadline. With only a handful of program staff, our ability to assist any one of those 800 plus applicants on the last day will be limited, whether support is requested in person, over the phone, or via email. So please work in advance to ensure we're able to answer your questions. We strongly suggest submitting all of your materials well before the February 11th deadline. If you must deliver your materials on the day of the deadline, several options are available. For the FY20 application cycle, DCLA staff will accept supplemental materials in our offices at 31 Chambers Street until 11.59 p.m. on Monday, February 11th, 2019. Take note that this is the same time the online application will close and that subway schedules may be irregular at that time. 
Applicants may also attend borough drop-off satellite locations, which will be available for applicants from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. only on Monday, February 11th. These sites will not be able to accept supplemental materials prior to 10 a.m. or after 2 p.m. on February 11th. The locations are in Brooklyn, the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation, in the Bronx at the Longwood Art Gallery at Hostos Community College, in Queens at the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, in Staten Island at the Staten Island Makerspace, and in Upper Manhattan at the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. Some highlights to keep in mind about supplemental materials. DCLA templates are provided for the board list and the funding plan, and if you are a social or multi-service, religious or educational institution, there is another template for the overall organizational budget as well. Background materials such as teacher or artist bios, press or lesson plans is an important illustration of the work you do and substantiates the services you're proposing. Refer to the instructions for specific examples of this sort of material, which should be specific, recent, and related to the projects being proposed. While background materials illustrate your organization for the panel, they're not a substitute for application content. Include the details the panel needs to know in the online application form itself. Please create two identical sets of the required documents you are submitting as background material, collate them, and fasten them with binder clips. Do not present materials in binders or put each page into a plastic sleeve. DCLA staff will have to disassemble those submissions to fit them in file folders for panel presentation. Instead, just label each item with your organization's name, collate the copies, and put them together with binder clips. Limit your supplemental material to what fits in one envelope no larger than 12 by 15 inches and send all materials in the same package at the same time. As guidance, if your supplemental materials do not fit comfortably in one standard letter file folder, you've compiled too much. Please edit your submission. All CDF applicants are required to file a cultural data profile with our partners at Data Arts, who this year merged with Southern Methodist University to become SMU Data Arts. The information gathered in the data profile is the same as it was before the merger, and for returning applicants, your previous submissions will still be available when you log on to the SMU Data Arts website at culturaldata.org. You are required to create a data profile for your FY17, entering information from your audited or reviewed financial statements if applicable. Once the profile is complete, you will generate the funder report for the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs Cultural Development Fund. Print it and include it with your hard copy supplemental materials. Although there is a button that says submit report to funder, we require a hard copy printout. Make sure that you send the correct report, not your complete data profile or the report for another funder. This is what the first page of the CDF funder report looks like. We recommend that you enter more than one fiscal year's worth of data into the CDP. As you can see here, your funder report will show your most recent three fiscal years. Those of you that have filled out CDP previously will see your prior information pre-populated. However, FY17 information is the minimum requirement to be eligible for the CDF process in FY20. Note that funder reports marked draft, will not be accepted. Once you've entered all your CDP data, there are more than 70 reports that you can run to analyze, visualize, and identify trends in your organization's fiscal and programmatic activity over time. The tools and information managed by SMU Data Arts can also help you to compare your organization to your peers in the field across the country. One of the benefits of the merger with SMU is that all data arts participants now have access to the Key Performance Indicator Dashboard, a tool created by SMU to allow organizations to compare their trends with others nationwide. If you have any questions about SMU Data Arts or the CDP, 
please call their support center from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. The number, along with other resources, is on the slide and in our instructions. When you are finished completing the online form, you will acknowledge that you are obligated to submit two parts of the application, the online form and the supplemental materials. This is the last step before your final review and submit. The final review and submit section displays your entire completed application for your review before submission. You can use the sidebar menu to jump to different sections. Give yourself and other preparers adequate time to review every section carefully before submitting. The yellow print preview button on the top right of this page allows you to easily print the application. Be sure to save a copy for your files. The yellow budget overview button is also on the top right corner of this page next to the print preview button. Don't forget to use it to see how your budget will be presented to the panel. The final review and print preview will display your responses and any missing fields will be highlighted in red. An online application is not complete and cannot be submitted until all the required information is included and all the boxes on the sidebar are checked. Take time to verify that the application is not only complete, but that you are confident it is ready for panel review. You may want to ask someone not involved in preparing the application to review it for clarity and for an outside perspective. Double check all entries, including those that are lists, to be sure the responses are complete. If multiple people worked on the application, be sure each of them reviews all sections and confirms that their information is accurate and consistent. The Certification and Release This is a legally binding certification. A person with signatory authority must certify this application on behalf of the organization after thoroughly reviewing the document. Only then can you submit your application. Do not hit the yellow Submit Application button until you are sure that the application is ready for panel review. You cannot change your application after you click Submit Application. Those who've completed the CDF final report may remember that a program officer can release that form for edits after the deadline, but that is not the case for this application. Once you submit your application, all active users listed on your account profile will get an automated email confirming that you have completed the online portion of the application. Save this email for your records, and if you don't receive the confirmation, check your spam folder before calling us. This email will include your FY20 application number and another copy of the application checklist, even if you've already submitted your supplemental materials. Your application number is assigned automatically only when the completed online application is submitted. We cannot provide an application number before the online form is received. We'll be sending out panelist nominations to the field and hope you will consider nominating yourself or a colleague to serve on our grant making panels. As ever, we're intentionally seeking a diverse panel cohort that is representative of the broad cultural constituencies of the city of New York. We want to give you one last reminder that everything we just covered for the fiscal 2020 CDF application needs to be submitted no later than Monday, February 11th, 2019 to meet the deadline and be eligible for funding. Do not wait until the last minute. Complete a draft, give it to someone whose opinion you trust for a critical read, and have them identify parts that need clarification or more detail. Begin to compile the materials needed for your supplemental package now so that you can be sure it is ready and gets to us no later than February 11th. Remember, Monday, February 11th, 2019 is not the first day you can submit. It is the last day that you can submit. If you have questions after viewing this presentation, please contact our help desk at 212-513 9381. Thank you.